Welcome again. So as we've heard over uh, over again in the past few days, we realized that that cannot be emphasized further, which is we have no choice but to put the um, country ownership and the financial sustainability in the center of our response, including all our financing and the program decisions moving forward in, for our HIV response. In the past three decades, the, the whole world has invested about hundreds of millions of dollars in fighting HIV AIDS. However, more resources is required across the globe, no matter which income category the country belongs to. This is extremely uh, important for us to really gear our effort and attention to address this uh, very important epidemics. For example, for low-income and middle-income countries, all the domestic and international resources has to increase about one-third. Among all the resources, we required to fast-track our response and drive to zero by 2030. Domestic resources has tripled in the last 10 years and accounting for about 60% of all resources available in, income, in low and, and middle-income countries. Nevertheless, this is not sufficient because of the amb ambitious targets we set to end these epidemics and also the fact that the donor funding has been flatlining. So this only means that we have to really sharpen our angle on strengthen the, and the building strengthen national ownership and financial sustainability in every aspect of a response, and the, which is extremely critical. This means many different things. For example, it means we have to raise every dollar we can, but also more importantly, we have to use it smartly to leverage the impact. It also means that we have to design our programs efficiently and getting impact, not only making the impact sustains, but also the financial resources required. And to be specific, this means many, many things each one of us in this audience are working on every day, including reducing the input price and then lower the unit cost of service delivery, if possible, maintaining quality. It also means we must strengthen the national capacity for the longer term, with a longer term vision, as well as the health system in order for uh, very good service delivery. It is means we have to tailor our service delivery modalities, making sure we're reaching those who are in need, leaving no one behind, and integrating HIV into the broader social protection system, such as universal health coverage, and also, importantly, measuring and tracking sustainably along the way. So without further ado, let's hear from our colleagues uh, on this panel and listen to them based on their research and work, how we can best establish and strengthen the national ownership and sustainability in practice, and then we can open up for discussions. Would, I will let my co-chair Sergio to introduce the speakers. Thank you. Um, we're going to start with um, Ann Downer, who comes from the University of Washington, and is going to talk about lessons learned from sustained global health investments. Um, Ann, you have five minutes. Okay. Good morning, or afternoon. I guess it's afternoon. I'm Ann Downer. I'm the executive director for the iTech program at the University of Washington. Uh, we're affiliated, iTech is affiliated with UW, and we're in Seattle, Washington. I think we all know and are proud of how much progress has been made uh, in the fight against AIDS and HIV. And I think we're all sensing, if not uh, knowing now, that the donor. Uh, that donors are beginning to pull back. Um, this is inevitably going to threaten, uh, or at least threaten to undermine some of the progress that we've made in HIV. And I believe that means that right now we urgently need to look at the issue of sustainability and to figure out exactly how we're assuring that the investments that we've made over the last 15 plus years will be sustained. Um, to do this, I think that we need a package, a sustainability package, um, a, a, a set of approaches that we know works and that we assure 
are planned into transition uh, early in the process before transition occurs. Um, I use, for thinking about this uh, sustainability package, the metaphor you see at the top right-hand side of the slide here. Uh, it is, do you know what it is? It's the Jenga game, yeah. And I think about sustainability this way, that the building blocks that build the tower uh, are all important pieces of sustaining our investments over time, and that some of them are more important than others. If you pull some of the blocks out, uh, the tower can topple, and our job is to begin to understand which are those essential blocks. Um, iTech has been a PEPFAR partner since 2003, right from the start, and in those years we've transitioned more than 300 programs to local ownership. Um, products, tools, guidelines, actual uh, project interventions, mostly to uh, national governments. In 2017, um, we decided that we'd like to study some of our transition projects to see if they were in fact being sustained over time. These are the six projects that we studied uh, over the past year and took lessons learned from. Um, all of them happen to be, tra uh, have been transitioned to national governments. Sometimes we transition to universities or NGOs, but all of these were transitioned to government. Um, all were still active in one form or another, uh, but all of them had had changes over time since transition that I think uh, lend insight and give us some lessons learned about how to sustain things longer over time. One thing has become clear to me in the last uh, year looking at, at these programs and others, and that is I think we know how to do transition. Um, if you look at the literature, which I'll show on the next slide, uh, we know what the building blocks are, the Jenga blocks for transitioning a program. What's a lot harder is the, tra is the sustainability part. Um, so what did we learn? in looking at these six programs in depth and discussing with stakeholders and key informants whether they had been sustained and why. Um, one of the things is that we observed, uh, our observations confirmed what you see in the literature almost completely. Um, we know that these five elements at the top of the slide are key components of transition planning and work. Uh, what we also discovered in our discussions with key informants was, was that w were three additional factors that our key informants felt uh, contributed to sustainability beyond the point of transition. And those things were uh, the presence of a champion, uh, the, the partner that we transitioned to, the transition partner prioritizing the transitioned intervention because they felt it was based on real need in the community or demand. And the third, which is by far the most important and highlighted here, every key informant that we interviewed said that there needs to be a period uh, of some, some length of time of, of continued financial and technical support to assure that implementation and transition occurs that uh, adaptation is occurring over time as needed and that quality is maintained. The third being the most important, well, let me just finish here. We don't need the slide. Um, the third thing said to me that we need to plan more, more slowly, more carefully, and more realistically for transitioning that leads to sustained programming including attention to the unexpected. Uh, for instance, in Haiti, when the earthquake occurred, we had not planned for the additional costs that would be required in an emergency to use the Isante EMR. A hiring freeze in Botswana resulted in um, severe handicapping of the m and &E cadre program that was transitioned to government there. And in Tanzania, the program was self-supporting and we had, we had planned for that with the government of Tanzania. Uh, however, the tuition costs that were collected did not cover updating the program over time. So this is my main message in my short time here, that I think we need to put together a sustainability package that identifies all the blocks in the Jenga tower, and especially those that are so critical that if they're missing, they'll topple the tower. 
Um, and that package might include contingency planning. It might include um, the structural elements that contribute long-term to sustainability. The main thing we have to guard against two rapidly divesting programs to local ownership without proper planning. In other words, slow and steady can really build the tower. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to continue now um, with um, Cynthia Braga Batista, who comes from the Ministry of Health in Brazil. And she's going to tell us how um, it was possible to offer Integra's inhib in inhibitor as first line ART while maintaining the sustainability, sustainability of the Brazilian policy of universal access to drugs. Thank you. Good afternoon. I will present how it was possible to offer Integras inhibitor or first line art while you maintain the sustainability of the Brazilian policy of universal access to drugs. This abstract was developed with contribution from Renato Girardi, Eduardo Malheiros, Marcelo Freitas, and Adele Bezaquin, who I would like to thank. Brazilian antiretroviral therapy is free and offered to all people living with HIV by federal government. In 2016, about 500,000 people were on antiretroviral therapy. Until 2016, the Brazilian protocol recommends efavirenz, tenofovir, and lamivudin regime a first-line art and integrase inhibitor as, as rescue therapy cartography in this case. But we start a negotiation to offer Integras inhibitor, even considering the impossibility of generic drugs acquisition due to patent laws. With an annual budget of about $350 million to purchase antiretroviral drugs, the objective of the government was to offer Integras inhibitor without significantly increase, uh, increase, oh my God, just a minute, the budget. Therefore, two strategies were used. First, price negotiation through bidding process for the two options available in Brazil, dolutegravy and haltegravy. Only one of these would be included in the guidelines as a preferential first line. Uh, and the same medication would be indication for rescue regimes. And second, reorganization of the guidelines drug portfolio include the remove of obsolete drugs, for example, fosamprenavir, didanosine, stavudine, and sakinavir, and the recommendation on switching patients to new regimes. As a result, we can see in figure one, compares of budget used to purchase Ivory per line in the years of 2016 and 2017. Even with increase in costs with the first and second lines, the economy generating the third line was decisive for expansion of the use integrals in Brazil. In 2016, Treatment cost with available in Brazil was about $90 per day. And after negotiation, there was a reduction to $1.50 purchase of dolotegravy. The strategies used by Brazil proved advantages and made it possible to offer a better antiretroviral treatment without significantly budget changes, as it is possible to see in the figure. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, okay. Um, we'll hear now from Andres um, on the cost of HIV care and treatment. Andres comes, comes from um, the CDC. Thank you. Uh, 
with open. Open, open, okay, great. is moving my slide. There you go. Great. Sorry. <laughs> okay. My name is Andres Berruti. I'm a, um, a team leader of economic and modeling at CDC. And I'm presenting on behalf of, of the team, uh, the Mozambique team, and some implementing partners. I am thankful for Anya Krivelova, ICF, um, a Minister of Health in Mozambique, Francisco Mafana, has been a really um, a great contributor to this work, as well as people from CDC Mozambique, uh, Daniel Singer and Alfredo Vergara, the country director of Mozambique. So I'm really uh, thankful for that. But there were other uh, stakeholders that also contributed. And as I always said, like any, any single cost study, it's a, it's a collaboration of many, many, many people. So I cannot really, I'm just presenting that on behalf of everybody in the team. Great. So when we did that, because I mean, the, the Ministry of Health, um, they have a plan, they have a five years plan, and I, in order to just make sure that things are moving forward, you need to understand what are the, a little bit, what are your, your the, the beginning, and then what are the things that you need to actually to, to do, uh, and then what are your tools you have, and the information you have in order to make sure that you, you continue the plan. The Mozambique is facing an epidemic, um, and it has an ambitious plan in 2015 that is go all the way to aim certain amount of like uh, people on to scale up by 2019. In order to do that, you have to be organized and you have to be sure actually everything fits uh, the requirement. In order to do that, what we did is like we tried to understand what's going on, what are the different information we have and how much it costs, who are the drivers, uh, and who are actually the founders, uh, and how you allocate the, 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 the information in order to produce uh, the treatment. We went to 40 facilities. Uh, we cost each of them very extensively and, um, and, uh, and very comprehensively. And then we were able to actually to, um, uh, to compare and then to obtain uh, different information. Because it's only five minutes, I will focus on, on the main result. I encourage everybody just to, if you have additional information, either ask me or stop by, by the poster uh, in, just in front of hall 11A, and uh, that has additional information. But I, very quick, so how much it costs to produce or to put one person on treatment per year in Mozambique? If you include, um, the drugs is uh, $110 per person per year, and those are dollars from 2017. If, if you subtract the drug, it's around $40 per person per year. Um, and for those who are still not on treatment on pre-ART, <coughs> that are still uh, some patient there, it's $35 that we also have to, to, to cost. I mean, something to notice here that um, we divide into different categories, patient, and then they were adults and pediatric. Pediatric happened to be cheaper or less expensive, but the reason is because the package is different. And this is one of the conclusion, actually, um, uh, of, the, of the study. Uh, the first conclusion is, like, besides ARVs, there are other important factors, other important drivers, like personnel, like laboratories that actually contribute actually to the cost. And you have to take into consideration that because otherwise you won't be able to, to you will be under budget actually. Uh, and they are, and, and they are they, you need actually in order to produce that, that services. Uh, we also thought that it would be a good idea to understand internal programmatic activities, like how it's divided. Are we putting too much money into the, um, into general administration or actually you're, you're, you're doing a balance of what is need to happen in clinical, m and &E, lab, and so on and so forth. The majority goes 52% to clinical care, but they, um, I'm sorry, to, um, to, to ARVs, but also clinical care and lab, as we said before. In terms of who is contributing, uh, Ministry of Health, 28%, Global Fund, because it's by the drug, 
uh, almost 50% and USG 32%. I, I want to finish with this one, this, this slide, and this is one of the conclusion. The, there is a re big range of costs because they produce the service in different way in all those 40 sites. But when you plug them together, you, you realize that if you can increase the number of patients, you become more efficient. And if you become more efficient, actually, your per, per unit cost decreases. So this is actually one of the take-home exams. And also, um, um, that, that there are other drivers beside the ARVs. A lot of people say ARVs is an, an, an personal, but actually lab is also important. And the five minutes are up, so I will conclude with that, and I will thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you, Andres. Okay, um, we're going to continue with um, Oleksii Yeremenko, okay, uh, who comes from the Ukraine, and he's going to talk about uh, building sustainable HIV service delivery model at a local level in Ukraine. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alexei. Uh, I'm from uh, USAID HIV Reform and Action Project uh, implemented by Deloitte Consulting. Uh, significant financial dependence on external donor funding, more than 67% uh, of uh, HIV total uh, funding in Ukraine, threatens sustainability and availability of critical HIV services in the near future. As donor funding of HIV programs continues to decline in the middle-income countries, uh, Ukraine needs to revise uh, its national HIV responsible strategy, funding action, and optimize current allocation um, uh, service delivery system. During 2016 and 17, um, uh, HIV reform and action project with um, uh, local NGO uh, implemented uh, sustainable HIV model service delivery uh, at local level. Uh, model covers 14 um, geographical locations. Uh, it includes cities and rayon level. Uh, key uh, components of sustainable model include um, advocacy for increased local uh, HIV funding, especially in um, rapid testing and uh, social services. Removal uh, legal and policy barriers uh, to scale up of HIV services. Introduction new financial model uh, such as uh, social order and OST co-payment model. Uh, decentralization of integration uh, HIV services to primary health care uh, and uh, optimization of human uh, resources for community level <coughs> service delivery. Uh, this approach at local level help uh, to achieve significant increase of uh, sustainability of HIV services through local governments, strengthening mobilization, local financing resources uh, for critical HIV services. Uh, local level advocacy efforts resulted in strengthening partnership between government and civil society in HIV service delivery and increase uh, 14 local budget allocation uh, for HIV response uh, from 225,000 um, uh, in 2015 uh, to about $2 million um, uh, in 2017. Uh, the sustainable model at local level allowed to achieve decentralization of HIV testing services, including provision of IRT, opening new OST sites, uh, promotion of the provision OST upon prescription and piloting OST copayment model, introduction, introduction of uh, social order and training for local change engines and service providers. Special attention was made uh, on decentralization of HIV testing services using two rapid tests. Number of primary health care providers who providing HIV tested uh, increased up to 10 uh, in 10 times from 25 PHC providers uh, in 2015 uh, to 225 in 2017. First time uh, to support public health uh, uh, care providers, local government contracting NGO uh, to provide preventive and support services through social contracting mechanism. Uh, sustainable financial HIV uh, services, not only national level response, but should be priority for local government. Sustainable model result and replication plan have been shared with state local administration beyond the selected uh, regions to fast track comprehensive, integrated uh, and sustainable HIV response in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. We're going to continue now with um, Hian Ting Guyan, who uh, comes from the Health Finance and Governance Project in Vietnam, and is going to 
continue discussing sustainability um, in the case of Vietnam. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here and I'm from Health Finance and Government Project in Vietnam. Uh, the project is funded by PEPFAR USAID and is implemented by um, Up Associates. We support the Ministry of Health and Provincial Government to integrate uh, the donor-funded treatment facility into health insurance scheme. And I'm thankful for my colleague at the Ministry of Health, VAC, at the USAID, and at the project for my presentation. So you know that uh, in Vietnam, donor-funded OPC, uh, they are located at different places. Some OPC located at Provincial HIVS Center. Some other OPCs, they are located at the Preventive Medicine Center. And both of these um, facility, they are not curative health facility, and they are not um, eligible for social health insurance reimbursement and some other, they are located at the provincial and district hospitals, and, but they operate uh, independently from the hospital. So in general, these uh, OPC, the outpatient clinics funded by donor, they are independent from the uh, public health system. And, and now, and how are they uh, integrated in order to get uh, reimbursement for HIV treatment for the patient and for the facilities? So with the PIC and the PMC, who, which are not a curative health facility, um, they either have to transfer patient to a uh, hospital or a health facility in the nearby area, so patient with health insurance card can access to service paid by health insurance or they have to go through a long process to restructure themselves or reorganize themselves into uh, a curative health facility which are eligible for health insurance reimbursement. And for the OPC operated in the hospital, it's much easier. They just need to become part of the hospital, uh, of the existing hospital, which the hospital already provides treatment through SSI services. So by the end of the integration progress, uh, patient with health insurance card uh, um, can, can get reimbursement for their HIV treatment at their health facility. Uh, these are the examples of the um, um, patient. They are registering at the SSI examination counter in the hospital. And our HIV patient, he signed for his medication. Uh, which is paid by social health insurance fund at the district hospital rock counter. So having a quick look at the integration progress in the whole country and in PEPFA supported program and in uh, SFG supported program. So you know that for uh, over two years, uh, Vietnam has been able to integrate uh, over 300 treatment facility into social health insurance fund by March 2018, and uh, of which uh, 223 are PEPFA supported treatment sites. So you know that PEPFA, uh, they are declining their support to Vietnam, but they are supporting a tran responsible transition into the government. So our project is supporting nine provinces and other PEPFA projects supporting other provinces. So uh, over two years and a half, we, we could have uh, like, okay, in our nine provinces, there's a total of 118 treatment facility, and we are expecting that by September, we could have actually like more than like 80 percent of treatment as uh, facility into health insurance program. So our work uh, hasn't finished. We will continue to complete the integration uh, at the remaining health facility, mainly with the uh, complicated one uh, in PEPFAR focused province of by USAID and our government 
and we will prepare the health facility for reimbursement of ARV through Health and Southern Fund starting in January 2019 uh, in the context of multiple funding still because um, donor provide ARV, part of the ARV until 2020. And we expect that there, by doing so, we contribute to ensure financial protection for people living with HIV AIDS through social health insurance and help Vietnam achieve the 1990 goals. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, our final talk today um, is um, going to be about the PEPFAR Sustainability Index and dashboard results, and Christopher Hart is going to tell us about it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Sergio mentioned, I'm Chris Hart, and I'm with the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, um, PEPFAR, in Washington. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for letting me present, and also my co-authors, who you'll uh, see listed here, and the other presenters on this panel for very interesting talks. Um, I'll just start by saying that sustainability really is a critical element of PEPFAR's approach to reaching and maintaining epidemic control. And over the past few years, we've really made big strides in hardwiring sustainability into PEPFAR's business processes. And the Sustainability Index and Dashboard, or SID, is just one component of that. And today I'll be talking to you a little bit about the results from the third iteration of the SID, what we call SID 3.0. So um, I see some familiar faces in the room, and many of you may be familiar with the SID. But I'll just give a quick overview of what it is. Uh, basically, back in 2014, there wasn't really an existing tool to measure the sustainability of the national HIV AIDS responses. And I do want to emphasize that it really does look at the national level, not just the PEPFAR component. So we rolled out SID 1.0 back in 2014, then underwent some, some pretty substantial revision, and we did SID 2.0 in 2015, and then rolled out SID 3.0 in the fall of 2017, and it was completed in 41 of our PEPFAR-supported countries. So the SID is basically divided into four domains, which are then subdivided into 15 elements. And to go back to Anne's theme of the Jenga blocks, I think we sort of think of these as those critical Jenga blocks of sustainability. They're the key components that, you, that are required for a sustainable um, epidemic response. So the SID is completed through a participatory multi-stakeholder process. Um, stakeholders include the partner government, civil society, the private sector, and other bilateral and multilateral donors, along with the PEPFAR teams. And you'll see that there's about 90 individual questions that fold into these elements, and each element's given a score out of 10. And there's sort of three key things that the SID provides us. Firstly, it helps the partner country government and the other stakeholders assess the current state of the national HIV AIDS response and sort of identifies those specific strengths and vulnerabilities. It also provides us with essential data that's used to determine health systems investments, and it gives us metrics where we can track the impact of those investments over time. It really feeds into some other processes we have, um, understanding the above service delivery investments. And finally, it's an important health diplomacy tool and helps us to engage partner governments um, and so that everyone's on the same page with what's needed. So, as I mentioned, there's about 90 individual indicators, so the SID really gives us a wealth of data. I'm just going to present some very high-level findings today. And um, so you'll see on this first slide that in our 13 countries, 13 PEPFAR-supported countries that are closest to epidemic control, from SID 2.0 to SID 3.0, we saw significant improvement in 12 out of 13 of those countries. And I think what this demonstrates is that focused effort on in specific areas can lead to these demonstrable results and can also lead to some of the efficiencies that have been alluded to in earlier presentations. And secondly, I don't think this one is all that surprising, uh, middle-income countries generally scored better than low-income countries, and you'll see that that's particularly true in elements that are related to national health systems and to financing. Um, and I think, again, this just reinforces the idea that it helps 
um, all the stakeholders to know where effort needs to be targeted. So I'll just conclude with, with three main points. I think we found that despite these persistent differences based on income level and other factors, overall SID scores have shown progress toward greater sustainability from SID 2.0 to SID 3.0. Um, secondly, I'd like to emphasize again that in those 13 countries that are close to epidemic control, we've seen that targeted effort and focused investments really can help build more sustainable national health systems. And finally, the CID is a valuable tool for assessing sustainability, but it's also important to think about deeper analysis to look at the activities and the interventions, and what we're currently spending on them and what they should cost, and how we can find efficiencies. So there's still a lot to learn, and I think we'll learn even more as the CID continues in the future, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, um, I think we heard um, very interesting, um, relevant examples of uh, experiences on sustainability. And I just want to mention a couple of things before we start with questions. Um, one thing strikes me very interesting from this panel is that we heard experiences not only from different countries, but also at the different levels. And I, that, was, that was very interesting to me to see how we heard the experience from Brazil at the national level uh, negotiating prices and, and optimizing the guidelines. But we also heard right now from, from the donor perspective the issue of, of, of sustainability. We heard at the program level six examples, very important lessons learned. Uh, and even at the local level and the facility level, uh, local level in, in the Ukraine and the facility level, how the transition was uh, planned and, and implemented in Vietnam. So if I, I think those examples are, are very interesting. Um, one thing that is clear, I think, from this session is that um, as we move forward in learning and documenting, the, the, documenting this type of experiences, the information, for example, that Andres presented on cost is going to be key to be um, updated. Uh, but I, I also think at, from this point on, in the future, we're probably going to start thinking about more rigorous evaluation of these experiences uh, of uh, models for sustainability and, and integration and transition. Um, I want to stop there. You want to add something? Just to echo the point that because this sustainability issue is so complex, is so multifaceted, we saw the wide spectrum of topics has been conveyed by this panel, uh, accompanying to what you said. But I heard the word about the transition, and then this is in the countries that uh, so slowly graduate uh, from the fund donor funding, but also taking over major responsibilities, especially in financing the health system element. But um, other funders uh, other uh, funders may be having different plans of transition out of the country support. The country would have to think about how do they take it over slowly. And then there is other countries maybe more relevant is about sustainability, not necessarily transition, but nevertheless, everybody has to think about uh, sustainability. And then I noticed that I am focused on the transition for the health system element, but we know that like uh, only talk about in Eastern Europe countries, the transition is more difficult for prevention programs, especially about the key population. So every country has a different uh, focus, how do they actually can fully transition. And we heard again, uh, um, like Andreas and Oleg, your perspective on the HIV program, but we also have a hand talked about the broader health system uh, aspect. And then we heard Andreas talk about the NSP planning, about you need to get a better cost information so that you can budget your money properly. And then up until we have uh, um, also, Han, and also I like to talk about the service delivery. It's already moved from the planning to input price management to service delivery. And again, we also have the national f um, perspective and from the donor perspective. Essentially, I've heard a lot of buzzword. It's about efficiency. It's about uh, financial commitment. It's about the system and being flexible. And particularly what Anne said is uh, plan early. And then we will not be able to transition, you know, three years or six years before. And then donors actually 
actually starting to really own the countries 10 years before the transition starts so that everything can be put in place with the time we have. And we heard a lot about emphasizing on data. This is uh, amplified by the, re uh, by the example of Andreas and also Chris. We need some uh, data to keep us in track, measuring how are we getting more sustainable over time. But anyway, I think it's a very rich discussion and we would welcome more insights from the audience. So it's now open the floor for questions and comments. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much um, for all the insightful presentations. My name is uh, Titi from Zimbabwe, Minister of Health and Child Care. I'd like to um, pose a question to Andrea. Thank you for the costing study in Mozambique. Um, Andrea, I wanted to find out whether um, pregnant women were part of the study sample and, and how did you, uh, how were the costs like? Because there are also ANC related costs, how were they computed? And also the, the cost per patient per year, I wanted to understand, did you disaggregate by the different tiers of the health system? Um, you mentioned that there are site level characteristics that influence the costs. I would like to find out more, what are those? Uh, so, so we're going to take uh, another couple of questions before um, we answer. So good afternoon. My name is Dr. Aditiloy. Uh, I work with Japaigo from Nigeria. I wanted to thank the panelists, particularly Handona, for laying the foundation on that piece. You know, so this is one of the best sessions I've attended. So I particularly want to ask, this is a difficult question, Transition is sustainability, which is key component of what everybody is looking at now. Uh, uh, the presenter from Brazil, you know, I know they are in middle-income countries. They are now having their program. I was thinking I will see somebody from South Africa in the panel to see, to ask particularly how have they been able to to transition program from donor funded program in the past year to now owning their program. Uh, but I know that there are different donors implementing different programs, and because those donors don't triangulate and talk to one another, uh, if one is pulling out, perhaps another one is still there. So how do you manage to look at this program and the complexity and ensure that you have a proper transition that is country-owned? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Walter Mosso from Nigeria. Um, to our colleague from Brazil, I just wanted to confirm that the one dollar fifty cents for DTG is just to procure DTG, is not to deliver it to the last mile. I just want to be sure and be clear about that. So it seems this is the last question. So why don't we take it? Um, we... Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian McFarlane. I work for the UN agency, uh, UNFPA, uh, the UN Agency for Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights. I was inspired by the uh, a slide that Brazil showed, where there was a tiny, tiny yellow line, which was next to prophylaxis. And, and, and then also in the Ukraine example, there was a point about, I think it was $50,000 was being spent on social contracting for prevention and support. My question to the panel would be, if there's been any thinking about the benefits, cost benefits of prevention in terms of the efficiencies of our response to HIV. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, let's um, give a few minutes to the panel to answer. Andres, you want to go first? Yes. Is this working? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, thank you, Dr. Apollo, for uh, your question. Uh, for the first question, um, uh, we have not included. So how we did cost study because we you can you have to draw the line at some point so what we focus is specific on ART adults and pediatric we we did not focus on PMTCT uh, and ANC so uh, if you are a mother that you are not part of the PMTCT program or you're not part of ANC program but you are a regular adult then you will be part of the cost but we have not included PMTCT in that. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's actually a, another, in a future program, I mean, we're planning to do that. We did that actually in Tanzania. We did a cost study on ART. We did a cost study on PMTCT and ATC. 
um, because they are separate programs. So the unit of analysis is the program, and unless it's, it's all part of the same program, then it makes sense actually to put everything together. Otherwise, it's easier to, it's easier and actually it's cleaner from the uh, political, uh, from the decision maker perspective to keep it uh, separate. For the second question, um, how much we, we included there? Um, uh, we included everything is, that has to do with the cost, um, but it has to do with the provision of the service. It is true that there are other activities that maybe even the Ministry of Health somehow it's, it's, it's contributed to that provision of the service. But we draw the line, what is the direct the direct activities that actually that need to, pr to provide uh, the, the, the service. So anything that it's, um, is more tangential is not included. Because at the end of the day, what you want actually to think again at, at, the, unit, at the unit as a program, that's why actually we draw the line. Can we do actually, can we include more? Yes. But you have to be careful that if you include too, too much, then what are the conclusions and what will be the information or the useful information for the decision maker at the end of the day? I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Brazil, as always, was very popular today and there are a few questions for them. Um, Cynthia, you wanna? My friends will help me with the translation about the first question. Hello, uh, Michelle. I work with the uh, and the Minister of Health as well. Uh, regarding the first question, I think it was about funding and uh, about South Africa. Well, in Brazil, we are nationally funded, so we do not depend on external funding. Uh, there is a law since 1996 that guarantees AIV treatment free of charge to everyone. So um, that's our national resources. Uh, regarding the second question uh, was the about price. the price, price negotiation. Uh, we negotiated until uh, the price was negotiated until it was delivered to the national program, so not to the patient. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and the last question was about uh, prevention. We have right. uh, PrEP that started now in January 2018. Uh, so. I think that answers the last question, I believe. It was about the cost benefit uh, for prevention on these efforts and treatment. Uh, anyone who wants to talk about that? Ukraine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, uh, what you need to know about Ukraine that we have a national aids program and key financial resources is um, uh, public uh, budget, global fund, and PFAR. And uh, about 95, 98 uh, percent of uh, um, service, prevention services are financed by uh, global fund and uh, PFAR money. And this is key tricky problem um, and uh, big financial gap. Uh, so this uh, 50,000 that I present was um, um, advocated uh, uh, with uh, local administration and uh, for small cities, small rayon, it's quite big money and it's additional money to uh, key global uh, uh, investment. Uh, and uh, of course uh, in Ukraine we have study on uh, cost benefit prevention. Uh, for example, um, uh, investment case study that was presented uh, in a um, uh, poster previous day uh, and my colleague sitting here, he can provide more detail after the meeting. Uh, so uh, we use this data for advocate uh, and for communication with local government. Um, so of course we are, uh, uh, because we finished this pro uh, program in just last year, so we are not discover how uh, this 50,000 was um, uh, uh, what the cost benefit of this uh, investing, but uh, uh, more generous uh, data we have uh, and can share. Any, anyone else? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. By the way, we are talking about cost of treatment. I just like to share that uh, our government uh, support tremendously for. Um, people with health insurance card. We pay one year uh, $35 uh, um, social health insurance premium, but the cost of ARV treatment is up to $150 per year. Uh, the viral load test, like if you 
have to take it twice a year. It costs forty two about forty two dollar each time. So the that is very strong government support. Yeah. Although we are low middle income country. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I wanted to appreciate the introduction of prevention back into our conversations. Um, w when we work to transition our programs at ITEC to our national partner, usually the government, we calculate the cost of the program and ongoing support needed, with a few exceptions, as I mentioned, like there has it, hasn't been enough contingency planning for unexpected events. But the question made me think, we, I think, assume that prevention is part of the interventions that we're transferring that are related to capacity improvement in general. Um, but I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't really called that out specifically to myself. Yeah. It seems that we have another question here. Thank you very much. My name is John Oko from Nigeria, Caritas, Nigeria. I have two questions for Anne. Uh, the first is, now, at the point of transitioning the, the programs to the national governments, are there standard funding for service delivery? I'd like to know if there's, there are standard sources for service delivery for, this, for, for these programs. And then to Christopher, um, you talked about 12 out of 13 countries, and um, there seems to be an outlier in, your, in, in, your, in, in what you showed. Can you tell us about the, the 13th country? Why is that country an outlier? Thank you. No more questions? Anne, you want to answer yeah, first? May I ask you to clarify your question, sir? Yeah. Are you asking if uh, what costs we're planning in at the time of transition? No, at the time of transitioning the programs to the national governments, yeah. you talked about um, um, funding for, for, for support and all that. But in terms of service delivery yeah. that, take, that, that, that go on, on, the, on, the, on the projects, who funds that? Is it the national government or who funds that? Yeah, I understand now. Thank you. Um, generally, well, every program we've transitioned has been a different kind of product. I mean, sometimes it's a whole intervention, a, a project, and it involves service delivery. Other times it's a curriculum or a, um, a long-term uh, educational intervention or uh, the electronic medical records system being strengthened in the country. So it, it depends a little bit. But generally the assumption is that our, our transition partner uh, will pick up the costs, the major implementation costs, including service delivery. I think that's your question. Yeah. And that, that's where I think the lesson learned in looking at this, these six, that's fine as long as you estimate the cost properly, but then things happen, you know, and they happen at critical times where, you know, the tower can basically fall, uh, even though it had been planned theoretically to be quite strong. You know, earthquake, national disasters, economic problems. Uh, personnel turning over, so the champion for the program has disappeared into another part of the ministry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris? Yeah, um, thank you for the question, and, and it raises a very good point, and I wish I had a better answer for you today. I think, the, as I mentioned, the CID has so much data. I think it does require a richer analysis to investigate why there are some of those differences across countries. Unfortunately, I don't have that um, analysis with me today, but I appreciate that's a very good point and, and definitely something we'll be looking into. Thank you. Shufan? Yeah, thank you. Maybe I take the opportunity to ask Andreas uh, the analysis. Actually, I was quite impressed. You conduct economic, uh, you know, cost analysis. This is not commonly done. We normally have the budget when take the expenditure, and I think it's quite a challenging to take an effort to analyze some of the capital investment. I'm wondering how how much is that such an effort, and then uh, how critical is to engage the countries, and then do you have a major data gap? that you encountered in order to derive a robust uh, economic cost uh, estimate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shufan, for, for the question. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, uh, we, we usually uh, see a lot of projections, but the problem is we don't have a, enough economic evaluations. And then in order to do that, the only way to go is just go and to the field and collect the data. Um, 
Mozambique in particular was a great champion in the sense that they understood that they had a good plan, but they need critical information in order to make sure that their plan <coughs> will not fail. Um, a, we've been working with, and I personally been working with Dr. Mofana it, since 2007, and we did the first cost analysis. We provide a lot of information to the Ministry of Health, and they realize how useful is that information. And then uh, it is very unique, Mozambique, in the sense that it's 40 sites. 40 sites require a lot of resources, but a, it was critical information from the Ministry of Health. Why? Because you cannot generalize region. You cannot, when in this case, there are provinces in Mozambique. They provide the service in different ways, and then, and then not all the facilities, although you have a national guidelines, one of the conclusions, not only the facilities, they do the same thing. So you need to understand why there is a big range in cost, and there is a big range in in provision of the service. So that was part of the critical uh, question that the Ministry of Health has. And then obviously that's why I said at the beginning, it is a collaboration between different stakeholders. I mean, CDC alone, Ministry of Health alone cannot do it. It was like from uh, the implementing partner ICF to, um, uh, to every single implementing partner or Peseiros that they were actually helping us with the data. And the Ministry of Health and CC we coordinate, and then and CC in the end and ICF who, who help analyze the data. Can I, part of the, or your question is like, how, what are the challenge? Well, I mean, it's a lot of challenge. It's a lot of resources. It's a lot of effort. But I don't think there is another way to do it. Otherwise, we will do, I mean, I'm in the team lead of modeling and economic of Division of City Prevention and CDC. When you don't have data, you do modeling. But modeling, you have to estimate. And it gets to a point when you don't have enough points or you don't have enough fundamentals, I mean, it, the, the, the estimation are not really robust. That's why those exercises are critical. And um, uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, did uh, at the U.S. level, did a recommendation that those cost studies need to happen every four years or five years. Uh, you need to update that information, and there is no other way to do it. Some countries are more homogeneous, and then you don't need actually to go to 40 facilities. Uh, but even if you don't have the resources, 10 facilities still is better than zero. Uh, great. So uh, uh, before uh, uh, Sergio is going to summarize the session, for me, I think a key take, point, um, take home points are that uh, this um, transition or sustainability is a joint responsibility. And then especially for countries graduating from the donor support, the donors must coordinate and the best supporting countries to be able to put a plan in place and smoothly uh, graduate out of the donor support. For me, I think the, uh, it is very important that before we talk about transition at a national level, actually the speakers allude to the importance of thinking about sub-national level transition plans that fit into the broader plan we have. And along the process, we really have to rely a lot on evidence and data, not only the cost data we talk a lot about and also the EPI data. So it's almost going to be a very, uh, you know, um, multi-stakeholder engaged process supported by evidence and data and through the active engagement and good planning so that we can reach to a very very, you know, smooth transition for countries and also strengthen the sustainability of countries and that is not immediately transitioning out of the donor support. So let us... I, I don't think I can improve that. So <laughs> and that's, a, that's a great summary. I just want to thank everyone for joining us and to the panelists for the great presentations. Uh, good day. <laughs>